Excuse me. Asato ma. Hold on. Let's start this again. Om Asato ma sadagamaya. Tamaso ma gamaya. Mrityodama Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Tatsat <coughs> From the unreal lead us to the real. From darkness lead us to light. From death lead us to immortality. Om Peace, peace, peace. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. This morning, I'll continue with the Arati songs and this topic of the divine incarnation and why divine incarnations are important. <clears throat> For those who may not have caught me two weeks ago, we made it. What I'm doing is, <clears throat> boy, this is going to be bad. Let's change ginger tea. Just give me a moment. Two weeks ago, we got through the first four verses of Kandana Bhava Bandana. That's how we know the song. Um, it's one of the arati songs that is sung nearly every day in every one of our temples in India, in America, and in the homes of devotees. They can uh, also sing it or stream are from many different sites online, this song. This song was composed by Swami Vivekananda long, long ago. And he was the one to introduce it when the very first monastery at Bellarma, uh, at, uh, yeah, at probably Baranagar, Mott. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if it was done there, but they, I think in the Beller Mott Monastery, when they bought the Beller property, and a building was made and built there, that was where the first official singing of this song as a daily routine occurred as there were young monks. We're talking in the 18... 1880, late 1890s. So, so today, I'm going to continue. We made it through the first four verses of Kandana Bhava Bandana. And I just want to mention a few things before we start this verse. This song is about the attributes of the divine incarnation of this age. Um, even though within this song, we never find that Swami Vivekananda used Ramakrishna's name, naming him. He was never named in this song, but it is clear that for Vivekananda and for all the young monks and devotees of after the uh, Sri Ramakrishna had passed away, that he is a divine incarnation. He is the incarnation for this age. And this song brings out the qualities of, this in, of the divine incarnation and how the divine incarnation 
helps those who are seeking their own liberation, their own spiritual evolvement. It is the divine incarnation alone who can grant moksha or liberation. You may think, well, I can meditate and get it myself. Go ahead and try. Even the monks of our order who have joined an order under the name of Ramakrishna, who have spent their lives in meditation, who have given up all desires for worldly possessions, the normal worldly desires for wife and family, all those things. They renounce that world seeking freedom, seeking their liberation, their moksha, uh, or mukti. And within our brotherhood of swamis, it is clearly understood that as much <coughs> meditation, japa, spiritual practices, repeating the name of God, as much as you can do through your life, is not sufficient alone to have your moksha, either in this life or after this life, to have your liberation. The idea I've learned by rubbing shoulders with many, both in India and here, only by the grace of the incarnation does that get granted to anyone. That special few who are seeking it, and if they seek it by learning to love that, that incarnation, developing such ecstatic love that it takes the notice of the incarnation of this age. So you may ask, well, what does it take? to get a wink of the eye of the divine incarnation who is subtly floating around, watching his universe, his creation. We can't really give those answers. It's something much more subtle than, than clapping your hands and saying, hey, I'm here. I've, I've done japa for three years or two months or two weeks straight. 100,000 times a day, that, that's not the way that we usually hear that somebody seems to have got their freedom even while alive in this earth. It comes through the grace alone. As we give gifts to our friends, maybe on birthdays <coughs> or weddings or anniversaries, it's up to us to decide who gets, who we give what to what. You might think of it in, a, in that way, that there has to be a close connection. So by praying to God, by thinking, <clears throat> thinking of God daily, that's how this connection may get made until eventually our mind has lost all interest in things worldly, achieving name and fame, having fun, enjoying this world. That no longer seems very important to those who really seek freedom from this world. With that said, I'm going to begin with verse 5. So the verse of the song, this is in Sanskritized Bengali, you can say, but it says, uh, Banjana Dukha Ganjana Kardunaghana Karma Kator Pranarpana Jagatatarana Krintana Kalidor. I'll be using Swami Harshananda's translation of this song. I've seen in our book some differences. I really do like his. Um, 
no need to try to make up my own. I'm not a Sanskrit scholar. I don't pretend to be. So he translates these, this verse this way. Destroyer of abominable misery. Destroyer of abominable, abominable misery. Why misery? Wait, are we all so miserable? There's a deeper meaning to that. We'll go into it. Mercy incarnate. So mercy is a feeling of, you can say, forgiveness, of wanting to aid another. So these words are describing the incarnation, destroyer of misery, mercy incarnate, and doer of arduous deeds. Arduous deeds, hard deeds, all of these apply in the life of Ramakrishna. We find, so this banjana dukkha ganjana, destroyer of abominable misery. The miseries from which we suffer, whether they're brought in by our own foolishness, our past karma, we always dislike our, our misery. Misery is misery. Nobody wants to be miserable. We all want to be happy. We are eager to get rid of our misery any way we can, even temporarily. However, we don't always succeed. We can get past one obstacle after another that tends to make us misery. So in spite of our best efforts, we don't know how to move on sometimes. And here it is that we need divine intervention. This is when people pray to God. It doesn't really matter what faith, Christian tradition, Buddhist tradition, we're all humans. We're all on that same plane, stuck in a world that inevitably brings great unhappiness as well as a few moments of joy and fun or happiness. So nothing, the author states here, nothing could be better than the assistance extended by an avatar. I like that. Who are you going to ask? Are you going to ask your friends to solve your problem? Or if you believe that God is listening, you will go straight to the grantor of such boons. I'm going to read a little here. Though Sri Ramakrishna was loath to help in mundane matters, like how do you get your phone to work? How do you get your computer to work? Those are mundane matters. His compassionate makeup would often break the bonds and the supplicant's prayers would be answered. He uses an example. The boon he gave to Narendra regarding the sustenance of his family Members is one such illustration. Narendra became Swami Vivekananda. When Ramakrishna was still alive, Narendra started, had, had found Sri Ramakrishna and accepted him as his teacher, as his guru. And his father had passed away. His father was a barrister in India a very generous one who put the family into great debt when he died. Money needed to be owed and paid back. And Narendra was considering renouncing the world, and yet he was the oldest son. That debt was on his shoulders, and it troubled him so much. His family was starving at home. There were days when he would go without eating anything. So he came to Sri Ramakrishna, whether he believed that he was an incarnation at that time or not, it's hard to say, but he believed that Sri Ramakrishna, if he would agree to do what Narendra was going to ask him, that it would happen. It would be made a fact. What did he ask Sri Ramakrishna? 
He asks that his family would at least have, always have, at least a minimal roof over their head and enough food to eat. That's all. Simple prayer. Because right at that point, it was a desperate situation at home. And that boon was granted by Sri Ramakrishna. The proof of that is that it's exactly what happened. Somehow the family went on. Whether the debts were all paid and all, I think there was probably some difficulty, but they did not go hungry. Okay, I'll move on. Karuna Gana, mercy incarnate. The very cause for God incarnating as man is compassion or unlimited mercy. Why else should God take the form of a human body and go through the suffering of life on earth? Jesus did it. Buddha did it. Sri Ramakrishna did it. All the avatars have exhibited this trait, this trait of mercy in their lives. Brahma, Krishna, in Indian, you can call it mythology, you can call it history, but India has a history of recognizing later these divine incarnations, such as Rama or Krishna or Sri Chaitanya. Uh, Buddha also has been looked at. Compassion is the one similar trait. So many, many instances of the master's compassion when people have come to him in need. We find that when we study the gospel of Ramakrishna, we find something will move him and as it were, some boon is granted that only an, in, an incarnation can do. So, karma kator, doer of arduous deeds, doer of hard work. So, unlike Rama and Krishna, who fought uh, wars and battles, they were heroic uh, hero types of incarnations. We don't find that in the life of Ramakrishna. He was a priest in the Kali temple. That was his playground. It wasn't, you can say, a very rajasic, an act of life, a life of karma, activity, lifting mountains, flying through the sky. No, he didn't do any of those things. His life was much more we can say sattva. Sattva guna was the pronounced feature in the life of Ramakrishna. He was quieter. No fantastic deeds other than look at his spiritual sadhana. Twelve constant years of one type of spiritual practice after another, through tantric practices, eventually ending up with wanting to know about the other world religions, Christianity, Islam, uh, all of those things. During that sadhana, he would go for weeks on end, days on end, almost as an inert thing. If you read his life, you will see that he was kept alive by others, putting a morsel of food in his mouth. His body would heat up during some of the sadhanas, so hot clay and mud would be baked on him, as it were. All of this is documented. This is not made up stories. This is fact. Doer of arduous deeds. 
no great athlete can go through what he went through. He would not, he would not survive. So why such a show of so much sadhana? Later on, we've come to say it's for us to just take note of and see how the world that is so real to us completely disappeared for him during these years. His sadhana ended and he had a vision of the Divine Mother who said, remain in bhava. Bhava is a mood of, of love, of love for God. He, Ramakrishna's mode of living was seeing the living Divine Mother, the Kali image in the temple that people would come and make obeisance to, was a living, was Ramakrishna's living mother, a living presence. And he saw the mother in everything in the world, in his wife, in the people around him, in the cats, in the temple. He saw the same divine presence. When we say the divine mother, it is that life presence in living things. It is the object present in things we believe to be unliving, inert objects. So, no ordinary devotee or seeker or moksha that we know of has a resume of sadhana that comes anywhere close to Ramakrishna's. It's the first time I read it, it was just hard to believe. And I thought, is this made up? Is this true? But I knew it was not made up. I trusted the literature of our order. And they take great pains to document everything that they put into print. With that, you have to start some, with something you can trust. Christians trust what's in the Bible. Sometimes it's word for word. Ramakrishna's teachings on these things, all these scriptures are a mixture of sand and sugar. Sugar is the essential part, as it were. Take the sugar and leave the sand that doesn't suit you. Sand may be rituals. Some people may want to do two, three, four hours of rituals every single day. And if they don't, they feel like they've fallen short in their spiritual practice. It's not uncommon. Orthodox Hinduism is that way. If those rituals bring the presence of God alive in that individual, then those rituals are doing what they were intended to. But if they're just practiced mechanically, and that person goes back to his daily job, his daily work, his daily chores, without any more thought of God, because he already finished thinking of God, as long as we compartmentalize our life, okay, this part is for God, this part is for the 99% for the world, and 1% for God. How many hours do we spend stopping our lives and thinking about, this is all God's, this world isn't really our world. It all belongs to the creator of this world. When our life eventually looks like that, you can know that you're starting to think of God more and more. And when you realize every moment of the day that everything you see, say, do, hear is part of God's creation, when that becomes your perception of the world, you will have it advanced nearly to moksha. <laughs> okay, there's a little aside, but it's important to understand Ramakrishna's life is a reference, not just for the devotees of Ramakrishna, for anyone who's trying to build up a spiritual life, who has a meditation practice. Next. 
part of this verse. This is the last part of verse 5. Pranarpana jagata tarana. It's describing one who sacrificed his life for saving the world. Protection, well, let me see. The author is talking about some uh, statements out of the Rig Veda and others, but he goes on to say, our history, meaning Indian history, is replete with instances of such noble souls sacrificing their all, even their lives, for the good of the world. Sri Ramakrishna was no exception. His life was given only for this teaching. So, protection of the world is of two types. This is interesting. This is Jagata Tarana. So, warding off a particular crisis, which we saw in the lives of Rama or Krishna, in the Ramayana, in the Mahabharata, where they destroyed, these incarnations destroyed the bad guy, Ravana, Kamsa, others like that. That's the first <clears throat> type of protection. The second type is endowing one with spiritual inclination so that one turns to God and can, by doing so, transcend and not be so bothered by the problems of life that some people take their lives in their own hand and finish it because they can't cope. So this other kind of protection from the divine incarnation is the invisible grace, you can say, that has made us interested in turning to God, not to our best friends, not to the police, to give us aid and assistance, and to turn our minds towards spirituality. If our minds go towards spirituality, your back will be turned to the world. You will be walking away from ambition, name and fame, um, wanting to be someone in a big world where we see, we see who's on the top, they fall to the bottom every day uh, or every few days. Nobody stays on top. So that grace offered by Ramakrishna was that second type of protection. So. They're using the word protection. That's what the Sanskrit word, the Jagata Tarana, is implying. So, I'll read a little here. The protection afforded by Sri Ramakrishna was of the second type. Ultimately, this is the superior way, since none can stop the problems of life from cropping up once again. The world goes on. War, people like and dislike things, and that leads to wars <laughs> with other people, with other nations, with, from, from politics to every part of the world. Uh, disagreements on what gifts to give for a wedding. <laughs> they might break their marriage up for that. So, problems are an integral part of our life. That's what he's saying. So sacrificing one's life for the good of the world, he's saying, is in two types. Becoming a martyr in the process, like Jesus Christ. Uh, there was a, a guru, uh, Bahadur, I think that's a Sikh guru. They literally gave up their life in, for this principle. And the second type 
of sacrificing the life is total dedication of one's life for the welfare of others. Dying a slow death in the process. So that's what I see happening in our, in our order. All the monks of our order follow that path. Sri Ramakrishna followed that path. Swami Vivekananda followed that path. They weren't eager to die to get out of the world. Their life had to be lived in such a way that their example would inspire us. Their life was only given for others. We have to remember that. That's not something you find every day. Can we do that? As monks, we, will, we try to imbibe that ideal. It's an ideal. But we may get lost in our own life also. So I'm going to read a little more of this. It is now part of history how Sri Ramakrishna, with his ever-consuming passion, out of compassion, sacrificed his life for bringing spiritual solace to one and all that came to him. People from every walk of life came to the Master, uh, both at the Dakinesha Temple and then lady, later at the Kasipur Garden House when he was sick for, for many years with a throat cancer that eventually he died from. Right to the last, people would come to him terrified of the problems in their life, and he would forget that he's dying of cancer and give some advice, give some solace. He himself is dying, and they're not even noticing. They're not, they don't care, because ordinary people don't care if other people are dying. I don't know them. I don't care. That's a common attitude. Look at every day how many people pass away. We don't know their names. We don't want to know their names. But if it's someone we know, look how we do respond. But everyone who dies has someone who knows them, you see. Why do we have compassion for the world? We're all in the same boat. Everyone feels, everyone suffers and everyone wants release from this suffering. So those incarnations have given their life willingly. They know what they're doing, and they knew how they would do it. That's a mystery that we may never fully understand. There's lots of theories and speculations that a divine incarnation is always aware of the role they play when they come to earth. When it's actually happening in real time, it just, people, only a handful recognize Ramakrishna while he was still alive. Only a handful, three or four at the beginning. Later on, Ramakrishna gave this prediction about himself. He said, when many start coming here, meaning to him, then know that it will all be over soon. When they find me out, he said, that is a sign that this is coming to a close. I have done my job. And that's exactly what happened. Before the end, people from all over part, different parts of India had heard about Ramakrishna and wanted to at least meet him once and get his blessing if he blessed people. <laughs> so, Krintana Kalidor, one who cuts asunder the bonds of the age of Kali. This period, this, what we call the Kali Yuga, <laughs> we, I thought I'd finish this song. <laughs> we were doing one verse today with the help of a deeper understanding. It's saying here, the chief characteristic of the Kali Yuga, otherwise called the Iron Age, is 
The addiction to bodily pleasures. Boy, don't we see that. I think it's a pretty accurate description of the Kali Yuga. Bodily pleasures. We want to enjoy through this body and every pleasure we possibly can find. But the problem is this leads to body consciousness more and more. I must have a perfect body. It has to look good. It must be beautiful. How many are given to be the most beautiful one in the room? And if they are, for how long? We know these things are, pass, are passing and fading. Look at the Hollywood movie stars. They try so hard to look 30, 40, 50 years younger because their self-identification was from 30 years ago when they were number one. And they can't stop thinking that that's what they should try to be to the world. What a waste of a life. So this addiction to bodily pleasures, the incarnation can get rid of that for us, to make us understand that. I'll read this. This leads to the strengthening of body consciousness to the detriment of Atman consciousness. If you're thinking of your body, you're not thinking of your spiritual self. This automatically, this following body consciousness puts you into such deep bondage. And that's what we call samsara, the bondage of this world due to needless addictions. Addictions to trying to be in perfect health forever. Nobody lives here for, forever. It's fine. Be as healthy as you can so that you don't be a burden to others or you don't have to give, take the help of too many other people or medical services most of your life. That's fine. So he's saying the only way of cutting asunder this bondage of Kali is by reversing the whole process through the infusion of spiritual values. Makes perfect sense. This is exactly what Sri Ramakrishna did throughout his life and, and died for. I see we have six minutes. Are there, are there any questions that have come up yet? Uh, I don't see anything. I'm going to move into the next verse. <laughs> verse 6. Vanchana kama kanchana atinindita indri, indriya rag tyageshwara he naravara dehapade anurag. You have renounced lust and greed, you meaning the incarnation. You have despised attachment to sense. O oh, king of ascetics, he's calling him the king of ascetics, 12 years of sadhana, best, O oh, best of men, give me attachment to your holy feet. So verse 6 is the plea of the singer of these songs. If you sing this song every day, better to read this English translation part while you listen to someone else singing. You can stream it online and remember the depth of the meaning. This sixth verse, Vanchana Kama Kanchana Atinindita Indriya Rag Yageshwara He Naravara Dehapade Anurag. You have renounced lust and greed, you despise attachment to the senses. You are the king of ascetics best of men, give me attachment to your holy feet. That's what the devotee prays for. Renunciation of lust and greed. That was Ramakrishna's twofold teaching, not just to monks, to householders. His teachings were not, the monks got private teachings. 
these teachings are for those living in the world. And he's giving you the highest secret right off the bat. Renunciation of lust and greed. I'll read a little of the commentary. He taught this after he himself practiced it perfectly. Beautiful. His renunciation of lust and greed are proverbial now, and it's true. He had a wife. It not, he never consummated any marriage. When he asked his wife who was sleeping in the same bed when he was young, he said, do you want to have that kind of life married people have? What did Sarada Devi say? No, I've come here to aid you in your spiritual teaching of life. Of course not. Then Ramakrishna told her, don't worry, you will have so many people calling mother, mother, mother to you in the future that you'll be almost overwhelmed with it. And that's exactly what happened. There was no lust or greed in the marriage of Ramakrishna with his wife. It was definitely a divine union. Let's see what else he says. So he's, his renunciation of lust and greed are proverbial now. Not only did he practice matri bhava, that's the attitude as towards one's own mother. Ramakrishna looked at every female form as mother, a very safe way to practice. But he also carried it to the acme by worshiping his own wife, Sarada Devi, as, the, as Sodashi, that's an aspect of the Divine Mother. He retained the attitude of a little child throughout all his life, and we see that. And he loved having, why well, he enjoyed having innocent young boys or men there uh, who had no experience with worldly pleasures that way because they were guileless. Their mind was still pure. Okay, we're running out of time. I'm going to ask the few people here, if there, is there any question you might have for me uh, present? I don't see anything online here. Okay. Oh, this isn't signed into chat. Uh, ben, do you have anything there? Okay. Is there any question? That, if that's the case, I'm happy to, well, let me just... Let me see what more on verse 6 he has to say. And we'll take the rest of this time. Oh, actually, let me give a few announcements. We've got just a couple minutes. Um, I believe tonight is Ramnam. Am I right? Anybody? Is it the first Sunday? I... Please look at our website. I believe it's been two weeks since the last Ram Nam, so I believe tonight is Ram Nam. It's every, basically every other week. It's, you know, every other week, and I don't know what happens when... It's the first and third. First and third, okay. And uh, the regular retreat at Tapovan will be next Saturday. Swami Satyamayananda will be there, and he conducts that retreat. Um, so everyone is welcome to attend. That begins at 11, I th am I right? 11 o'clock. Look at our website for any, maybe it's 10. For, any, for anyone wanting to attend our events, oh, of course it's one. It's after lunch, yes. So 1 o'clock begins that. Um, so, if you're new and want to come for the retreat, you're absolutely welcome and encouraged to. Um, the ad 
address and directions you can get on Google. If you just Google Top of On Retreat, it will bring you to our place. Um, is it third week? We have Karma Yoga. So, oh, here. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> good, good to have someone who's keeping track. So the third week, there's Karma Yoga at the Seattle Center. And we're just getting going with that. And on the fourth, that's a Saturday. And on the fourth Saturday, heavier outdoor work usually, Karma Yoga at Top of One Retreat. So with that, I will conclude with a chant. And uh, thank you for hanging with us today. Om Asatoma Sadagamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorama Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat From the unreal, lead us through the real. From darkness, lead us to light. From death, lead us to immortality. Om peace, peace, peace to all beings.